Let me begin by acknowledging and thanking the Lekwungen people, also known as the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations communities, for allowing me to give this address from their beautiful lands. Colonialism is not a historical event. It is still happening today. I'm very pleased to be addressing the UBCM for the first time as leader of the BC Green Party, although under the strangest of circumstances. I'm speaking to you 10 days into my new role as leader, nine months into the global pandemic, and four days into the most unnecessary snap election campaign imaginable. From my perspective, a state of emergency due to a viral pandemic is not the time to leave our province without a Minister of Health. A state of emergency linked to an economic collapse is not the time to leave our province without a Minister of Finance. A state of emergency at the start of the school year, with students and teachers worried about outbreaks in their classrooms, is not the time to leave the province without a Minister of Education. And so, yes, like many of you, I am finding that there is a lot to be angry about these days. But more than that, I know that there is a lot of work to do. And I've never been more determined to fight for the health and safety of British Columbians than I am today. As you know all too well, our province is being battered and tested by three concurrent crises. The health and economic devastation brought on by COVID-19 the continued heart-wrenching loss of life brought by the drug poisoning emergency, and rapidly accelerating climate change. I know that your communities hold the answers to these challenges, and I know that your expectations for this week was that you would be putting your solutions in front of ministers with the hope that you would have a provincial government that would support and enable those solutions. Before the election was called on Monday, that's what I was hoping we would spend this week discussing, solutions and actions. This week was supposed to be about you and your communities. Instead, the Legislative Assembly was dissolved on the first day of your conference, at a time when it has never been more crucial to focus on local governance. Prior to getting involved in local politics, I was a teacher, a job that I cherished, and I had no expectation of leaving. But in 2013, I got pulled into a fight against a provincial permit that would have allowed 5 million tons of contaminated soil to be deposited in the drinking watershed of my community of Shawnigan Lake. That fight took us four years, a lot of money, endless hours of lobbying, protesting, court time and advocacy to get the result that we were hoping for, that the permit was revoked. It was a hard fought achievement. And without the sustained effort and investment by our community, it would not have happened. Some of you may recall hearing me speak passionately about Shawnigan and the problems with professional reliance when I was at UBCM as a delegate in 2015 and 2016. In 2017, I ran for the BC Greens with the aspirations of reforming the professional reliance system that had been in place in BC since the early 2000s. So that what happened to our community of Shawnigan would not happen to any other community in British Columbia. I'm proud to say that with the passage of the Professional Governance Act in 2018, we are far closer to making that a reality. That act comes fully into force this November. Over the last three and a half years, my caucus and our staff have worked in good faith with the BCNDP to improve government policies, such as me working with Katrina Chen to make sure that our child care plans include early childhood education. And our climate com com commitments have teeth because of the work of our staff so that we have reporting and accountability requirements. Clean BC, our province's climate and economic plan, was jointly drafted by our office and government over the last three years. The plan's strength and ambition was greatly increased by the BC Green Caucus staff members, Claire Hume and Evan Pivnik, whose tireless work 
and our commitment to prioritizing science and transparency is how we designed a strong climate plan that the future progress can be built upon. Even still, because of the BC NDP's approval of the heavy emitting LNG Canada fossil fuel project, BC is miles off track its legislated greenhouse gas reduction targets, and the Clean BC plan remains only 75% complete. That work to bring it to 100% was due to be completed this fall. My Green colleagues and I stood 14 times to be exact to vote against the NDP and the BC Liberals joint initiative to give fracking companies $6 billion in publicly funded subsidies. We also worked in partnership with both partners, with both parties, agreeing to put partisanship aside, to pass billions in recovery funding as the COVID-19 pandemic started to spread across the country. Over the last few days, Mr. Horgan has been trying to justify his decision to send us into this unnecessary election by suggesting that the legislature had become unstable. Unfortunately, these justifications have lacked any basis of fact. I met with the Premier last Friday before he decided that it was more important that we were on the campaign trail than in the legislature, and I was clear with him that the BC Green Caucus would continue to provide the stability needed to navigate the second wave of this pandemic. Having worked so hard to advance solutions to the challenges facing this province, I hoped we would be able to solidify the partnership that has led to so many good outcomes for British Columbia. Instead, because he was riding high in the polls, we are now in an election campaign. Mr. Horgan's motivation is to try to secure a majority government and move beyond any pretense of having to work with others. This is despite the fact that it has been widely acknowledged, most readily by Mr. Horgan himself, that this minority government has worked well for British Columbians. The influence of the BC Greens on the quality of legislation passed must not be underestimated. Our caucus staff worked closely with the government's legislative staff to enrich and improve legislation from the very beginning. This collaboration means that we now have laws in place worked on by two caucuses, reviewed and ed edited and rewritten so that the intent was to see that the that legislation passed that was the best it could possibly be, like the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, the Climate Change Accountability Act, and the Environment Assessment Act, just to name a few. We got big money out of politics, we reformed lobbying in this province, and we launched an inquiry into money laundering. The list goes on and on. In a majority government, that legislation would have been written and passed with far less scrutiny and almost no collaboration. I would suggest that it takes a kind of arrogance to think that it is better to work alone. In contrast, minority governments have brought us long-lasting, positive changes to this country. All of you at your tables of local government work collaboratively to move forward the policies and decisions that you believe best serve your communities. And I'm sure that you all recognize that while you may not agree on all things at your tables, it is better governance to engage in debate and discussion and to consider different perspectives and viewpoints as you move towards your decisions. I am clearly frustrated at how our minority government has come to an end but I am deeply proud of what we have achieved in the last three and a half years. But let us look now to the future. I expect that 2020 will be recognized as one of the most transformative years in modern history. And our work right now is to determine how to ensure that we make that transformation one that is for the better. Adaptability is one of our greatest strengths. It is remarkable how we are able to reframe our lives to match the circumstances around us. For decades, climate scientists have presented data and modeling, urging decision makers to take action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But decision makers have not heeded their warnings, and emissions have steadily climbed. And in the Western US today, half a million people have had to be evacuated from their homes, and firefighters have had to contend with fire tornadoes while temperature records break over and over again. 
How many tipping points have we passed while well, governments have chosen to give the gift of subsidies and tax cuts to the fossil fuel industry? We have adapted to our altered world, but now we must also re choose to reshape our future world so that it will be more predictable and more stable than this year has been. We need some new normals that are not always worse than the normal that we left behind. You all know about adapting. You're building dikes in your communities. You're removing fuel load from neighboring forests. You are figuring out how to manage through yet another drought year. And you are informing your residents on how to navigate climate change. And yet too often, provincial and federal decisions fly in the face of the work that you are doing, and they run counter to your efforts. The decisions that are made today are absolutely going to shape a generation, even several generations. And so we bear, all of us, a burden of responsibility as decision makers that we could not have anticipated when we ran for office, whether it was as mayor or area director or councillor or MLA. Now is the moment when we recognize that the interconnected threats of climate change and inequality require of us a bold and courageous kind of leadership the kind of leadership that is demonstrated in the report of the UBCM Special Committee on Climate Action that proposes that the province work with the federal and local governments to fund a program that will, over the next 10 years, build 100,000 zero emission affordable wood frame homes at the same time as retrofitting 500,000 buildings to make them low and zero carbon. All of you know what is best for your communities and higher levels of government need to be guided by your leadership. Ensuring that every British Columbian has the opportunity to live a healthy, fulfilling life in a flourishing, supportive environment should be all government's number one priority and responsibility. When I look to the future of what is possible for our province, I see reasons for optimism and inspiration. We can be the authors of a new story for British Columbia. A story that recognizes interdependence, a recognition that my well-being is directly related to your well-being, as it is connected to the well-being of the river, the forest, to the well-being of your children, and to the well-being of the elders in our communities. An understanding and acceptance that what we do to the world, we do to ourselves and a dedication above all to protect the health and well-being of our neighbors and our loved ones, now and well into the future. Our new story can be enriched with the lessons of our last one. Earlier in this convention, we heard about the need for calm and responsible leadership. For me, that means remembering that we have been elected to serve the residents of our communities in the best ways that we can, by collaborating, by being respectful of those around us, by engaging deeply in our work, and by advancing the evidence-based solutions put forward by communities instead of our partisan interests. This isn't an election that I wanted, but it is one that I am willing to fight for. If there is one thing that has been constant in my evolving career, it is an unwavering dedication to the safety and well-being of children, students, and future generations. That and being consistently underestimated by our usual decision makers. I am ready to lead this province to a better place, and I welcome you to join me. Thank you.